Hello, and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. I am your host, Mike Marsh, the product manager at Dragonfly. Welcome back. I hope everyone is staying healthy and learning lots and getting lots done uh, during this crisis. We are now on to lesson 14. Lesson 14 will be on image stack alignment. So, uh, as always, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Feel free to put as much as you want in the comments. We want to know what is it you want to see in future webinars. We want to know what you like about this webinar or other webinars. So please engage us in the comments so we can respond and make sure that people are enjoying the content that's archived on YouTube. Now, lesson 14 will be on image stack alignment. We will be using Dragonfly 4.1. And as always, since lesson six, we'll be using a slightly customized version of Dragonfly as demonstrated in lesson six. Now, uh, for today's lesson, we will be using a data set and um, we're not going to be able to share the data set. So we do have a little bit of a restriction. I'll show you what I mean. So uh, I'm going to pop up a web browser so uh, you could find this if you wanted to. The data set I'm using is a FibSim image stack collected on a Zeiss uh, SEM microscope or maybe a Zeiss FibSim microscope. And let's go to Digital Rocks Portal. The data are complements of Matt Andrews. Some of you guys may know Matt, who does a lot of uh, really terrific work in rock imaging. If you go to the Digital Rocks Portal website, Google it, Digital Rocks Portal, and you just search for FIB, uh, what you will find in here, search, oh, don't use the search. Uh, I'm just going to do, uh, and I, I don't know why that search doesn't work for me. But if I just do a Control F and type FIB, and I scroll down, here we are, the Vega Muerta shell. So, um, this data set, the data set that you can download here has already been aligned and it's also already been segmented. So Matt has a couple of papers on image segmentation, uh, one of them is machine learning. You might want to take a look at these, uh, these papers. The data set that I'm going to use today is the exact same data set, but it has not been aligned. I don't yet have permission to share this. I'm going to see if I can get permission to share the unaligned data so that you could repeat the exercises that we look at today. Um, but for now, you can, you can always derive the aligned data that are available on the website uh, here, but for the lesson, we're going to use the unaligned data. And these are a serial FibSim imaging stack at 2.5 by 2.5 nanometers per pixel and 5 nanometers for the slice thickness. So that's the data set we're going to look at today. Now, let's resume the presentation. The agenda for today, we will be talking about image stack alignment. We're going to talk about tools for manual translation and rotation of images in an image stack. We'll be talking about automatic tools. There are numerous automatic algorithms. So I think you're going to find today's lesson satisfying and unsatisfying at the same time. It's going to be satisfying because you're going to see, ah, Dragonfly can do what I want. It can do the image alignment. But it's going to be unsatisfying because we don't have time to go into the details of how to use all of these different methods. Sometimes one algorithm will work better for your data, and another data set may benefit from another algorithm. So we're just going to use the simple sum of square differences today, but there are a number of different uh, algorithm options you have here. When you are doing automatic, registration, you'll see that there are options such as restricting the zone for where the alignment is scored. So this is very similar to what we did in the 3D, where we did a 3D box on the 3D blending, where this is just picking a zone in a 2D image. We're going to discuss what it means to get the right alignment. Is there a right alignment? What is the ground truth? And so we're going to talk about the banana cucumber problem. You'll see what I mean. Then we'll talk about how you test the alignment settings, and then you apply either to a subrange or to all images in the stack, and then apply the same transform to other image channels, which can be quite useful. Now I'm going to pop up the Dragonfly. I'm going to import two image data sets here. So I'm going to go to Import Image Files, and uh, yeah, here we are. So in my Downloads folder, I've got a folder called Zeiss Anonymous Shale uh, ESB. This is for Energy Selective Backscatter, and then I have Zeiss Anonymous Shell SE2. This is from the secondary electron detector, one of the secondary electron detectors uh, on the microscope. Now, I'm going to uh, just select one of these folders. I'll select the SE2. I'm going to do a Control A and click Open. Here, it shows me the different TIFF files. I'm going to click Next. Now, at this point, I'm going to name this my SE2, and pixel size is 2.5 by 2.5 by 5. It doesn't have the, the depth encoded, and that's common in image stacks. And I'm going to tell it to import that, but I'm also going to tell it to import another data set to keep the same geometry. The reason I'm going to keep the same geometry is I'm not going to load all 639 slices. You saw I hit the crop button. Um, to keep this manageable, I'm just going to load the first 250 slices of the data, data set. Now I click OK, I click Next or Continue, and now it's going to prompt me what's the second data. So that was the SE2. Now I'm going to go over to the ESB. All right, here's the ESB. Once again, click Control A to get all and open and Next. And so I'm going to call this ESB, make sure that the pixel size is encoded properly. So we're set at five, whoops, not 50, five nanometers per pixel. And we will, we're going to use the same geometry. So it's going to crop to the first 250 slices. This is 1.2 gigabyte data set. So this image 
and I'm gonna go ahead and hit uh, finish. It's gonna be 2200 by 2200 pixels by 250 slices. I'm loading two different image channels because when the images were collected, both detectors were running, so we have two signals or two image stacks. Okay, it's loaded one, that's the secondary electron signal. Now it's loading the backscatter signal. So these data, as I say, each one is about uh, 1.2 gigabytes, it looks like. Now, we will look at the image registration. You're gonna see that one image signal is less noisy. That is the secondary electron signal. And so we're going to try and perform our alignment on that data set. So um, I'm gonna double click here to go full screen and I wanna pop up the attribution. So this is FibSim data. It's, as we mentioned, a voxel size of 2.5 by 2.5 by five nanometers. This is the, from the Vega Muerta in, in South America. So this is an image. So this is a, a shale reservoir. So it's sort of source rock, reservoir rock, or shale oil exploration, and this data, these data come from Matt Andrew at Zeiss, and uh, these were imaged on the Zeiss and Riga by uh, Lorenz Lechner. So uh, yeah, I think I was, uh, Matt and I were co-workers when Lorenz collected this data back in 2014. Very nice image stack, and it's good for today's lesson. I'm gonna turn off the attribution. So I'm in Dragonfly, and I can see this image, I can see the 3D volume. If you look at the 3D volume, you may see these kind of jaggy lines from the side. So the top looks like rock grains. From the side, it looks kind of jaggy. If you come over here in the X, Z, or the Y, Z view, then you'll see that some of these look kind of jaggy. And that's because in each slice in the stack, the slice is not properly registered. So if it is displaced laterally, then from the side view, it'll, it'll look like this. So if I take this and I scroll through the slices, you can see it sort of moving around. So if I scroll faster, you kind of see it jump up and down and to the left and the right. And that means these data need to be registered. So, we could do this either on this data set, we could look at the uh, backscatter signal. So you see this is a, a noisier signal. It's got a lot of information in it. I can tell that this grain is a different mineral from this grain and from this grain because I've got the different brightness and contrast and it's harder to tell in the secondary electron signal. But the secondary electron, is le secondary electron image is less noisy and that's gonna help us do a better registration. In order to start the registration, I'm gonna right click on the secondary electron, the SE2 image, and I'm gonna go to slices registration. Much like the image filtering lesson from lesson, who knows what it was, lesson 11, I think, that lesson, that feature works inside its own context. So does this. So we're out of the main context. We are in the slices registration context. So I have limited control panels. I'm gonna have a fixed view, which shows me my uh, XY view and then an XZ and a YZ view down the side. Now, what I can do over here is I have a list of different tools I can use for performing a registration. As I mentioned in the introduction, we're just going to use the sum of square differences. This is um, basically the same as a correlation coefficient. This is the linear least squares. Mathematically, they're all the same, but here it's just written as SSD for sum of square differences. So for every slice, I can um, align it with the slice behind it, and then for every pixel, I can compute the sum of the squares, or the sum of the difference, the square differences, and that gives me a score, and I want to minimize that different score. Those it doesn't really matter. We don't really need to discuss the nuts and bolts of how the score is computed. You just need an algorithm that can compute a score, and then search different registrations and find the best score for each pair of slices. So we can choose an algorithm over here. There are some parameters right here. Now, um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to say let's uh, try running this on slices one through fifty, and I'm just going to use this parameters. Uh, what that is, we're just going to use the sum of square differences and uh, we'll hit apply. Now, it's not going to run on the whole volume. It's going to run on this sub range, which is slices 1 through 50. So each of these slices is, what is it, uh, uh, 2,000 or 2,200 pixels by 2,200 pixels. And so they're kind of big slices. So it is going to take, uh, in this case, uh, it says it's going to take a minute and a half. I thought when I tested this over the, uh, beforehand, it only took about one minute on this laptop. And I'll remind you all that I'm using a laptop with 16 gigabytes of memory. Um, it's a laptop from 2015, so it's not a state-of-the-art laptop. It doesn't have a super fast processor, and it's got a, a graphics card. It's a, technically, it's an NVIDIA 970 mobile, so it's three or four generations old. So I'm not using a state-of-the-art laptop, but a lot of you don't have, uh, don't have the luxury of working with a state-of-the-art machine, so this uh, is probably more realistic for a lot of users. However, if you do have the budget, we do get an appropriate workstation. Now. 
it has registered all 50 of those slices. I'm, if we go back to slices uh, one, as I scroll through, what you'll see as I'm used to using the mouse wheel uh, going up and down, you can see the top edge of the image move and maybe even the left or right edge. So you can see the image has slid or translated to fit what is behind it. So as you scroll through, you can see the features seem to be pretty well aligned. And then if I scroll all the way past slice 50, then you'll see it start uh, jittering around. Likewise, if I double click and go down here, you can see that these slices at the top, it's had to slide them over in order to get good registration up here. And then, um, and then if you come all the way down here, then you have very bad registration. So um, where we haven't yet done the registration because we only did it on the first 50 slices. So you can, you can do this and you can introduce more changes. So if I went to a slice and I, I didn't like the result, so if I looked at a slice and I say, well, you know, I think maybe it could have done a better job, uh, maybe it should have done some rotation or it should have done a bigger translation. One of the things I can do is I can change my registration method to manual. And now I could manually translate a slice and maybe even uh, rotate the slice about some center of rotation. And you can see down here that it's changing so that now between slice 45 and 46, I've introduced a change. So there's a, a big discontinuity there. And, uh, and so you can see the effect. Now, over here on the left, we can see that I can roll it all the way back to where I've done no registrations, or I can see the result of the first sum of squared differences on slices one through 50, or I can see the manual translation or the manual rotation. So this undo button, really it just takes wherever you are and rolls it back one step. So I'm gonna roll it back, uh, well, well, we'll just roll all the way back to none. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch back from manual to sum of squared differences. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the slice range because I'm gonna go ahead and apply it on the whole stack. I do wanna mention at this point, you can introduce a box. So if you wanted to say, I only want to look at this region of the image, so maybe there's some distractions on the side that could bias or perturb the success of the algorithm. Maybe you only want to look at a feature in the middle, you can restrict it there. You can also do follow template, and it will look at this region in slice one, and then it will compare it to slice two, and the box that it's actually evaluating can move. But we're not gonna use the selection box. So I'm gonna uh, deselect that. I'm gonna go ahead and tell it uh, to proceed, and it's gonna apply on all slices. Now, this is gonna take, I think it takes about three minutes on my laptop. Hopefully it doesn't crunch all of my CPU and you guys can still see my slides. So, um, while that is running, we are going to discuss the banana cucumber problem. So when you perform the registration, you get a different answer than what you started with. The slices have been moved. How do you know if you have the right answer? There are lots of ways you could move the slices. So uh, this all raises the question of the banana cucumber problem. So these slides uh, come directly from Mike Feneff at FIBIX, and these slides are, uh, uh, are inspired. Why is my computer beeping it? Um, these slides are inspired by a discussion uh, from uh, Marco Cantoni at EPFL. And so what these slides do for you is they explain the conundrum of slice registration when you have no ground truth. If I have this sample, which is a curved banana, and I were to cut it into serial sections, I would see images that look like this. Now, these slices, you see uh, the individual cross sections of the banana and the, if you were to put this in a slice registration, there is no extrinsic information that tells you that it should be curved. If you're just an image and you try to reconstruct it, you actually get a straight answer out. So you'll get something like this. Now, uh, I'm going to pause one second for explanation. All right, make sure we're all still hearing me. All right, great. So, um, if you perform a registration and you don't have any extrinsic landmarks, you can't be guaranteed that the answer you're gonna get is the right answer. So you're all, this is a risk you run. Now, um, this can be seen in real data. So here's an example of a polycrystalline metal where these grain boundaries should be straight, flat, planar edges. And if they're reconstructed and you don't have any extrinsic landmarks, you get these curvy edges because that's the best the software algorithms were able to do. If you have an extrinsic landmark, 
And if you're using a, a Zeiss Fib Sim uh, with the Fibix, it'll put these marks on there for you. They call them the Wolverine Claw. You may find that you can do uh, your own landmarks and other solutions. But in this case, with the Wolverine Claw, you get the straight edge. So you do have to worry about that if you don't have extrinsic landmarks. And so this is just a picture of landmark features called the Wolverine Claw that are implemented in that software. That is not necessarily the only way to do it, um, but I did want to show you these slides uh, from Mike Phaneuf and uh, at Fibix, as I say, inspired by Marco Cantoni's banana cucumber problem. So I think that's uh, worth discussing. All right. Um, all right, you guys can't see my camera, that's fine. I'm just gonna stop the camera feed. That's really no problem. Uh, stop video, and you guys should still be able to hear me, should still be able to see the, uh, see the slides. Now, now Dragonfly is crunching. We're gonna let it uh, crunch a little bit more so it finishes that slice registration. Um, now, with your own data, you will usually be able to look at the register, look at it from the side and say, is this structure realistic? Now, uh, the problem with that, of course, is you're subjecting your own user bias. When you look at it and say, I think it looks realistic, then you think you have a good alignment. Um, and that's just the, the restriction we all suffer is that there is no ground truth if you don't have these extrinsic landmarks. Now, I'm not telling you you have to have landmarks. I think 90 to 95% of operators probably do FibSim or other serial section imaging without landmarks, and it's a limitation that we all accept and proceed with. Okay, uh, I'm gonna give this another few seconds so the operation can continue and finish. Uh, when that finishes, we're gonna see that the registration is complete on the secondary electron image channel, and then we have the option to apply it. So, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to Dragonfly, and if we look here, the, uh, all right, still getting a regular beeping. Yeah, I'm getting the beeping too. I don't know what uh, Zoom is trying to tell us. Now, uh, what we look at in this image, if we double click, we can see the effect of the registration. If I undo the registration, you can see what it looks like before. If we repeat the registration, we can see what it looks like now. So we can do this and we can look at, uh, this cross section is probably even more telling. We can see that the slices had to be displaced laterally to get a good alignment. You can see in some slices, there's a little bit of charging that made one grain a little bit brighter, but the registration gives us a good answer versus this. Now, what we can do at this point is we can click the apply button and that will uh, commit all of these changes so that we go back in the main context and this data stack is aligned. We also have the ESB image. If we want to apply this computed transform on the other data set as well, we can click this button and then proceed to click OK. And that will uh, transform the current data set. It will also, there's either transform or create. It's do you want to overwrite the existing image channel or do you want to uh, create a new image channel that has the alignments applied? Now, because I'm low on compute resources, I don't actually want to apply this. I think that's enough for the discussion, so we're going to uh, cancel out of this. I'm going to stop my screen sharing for just a minute to see if we can uh, reset Zoom. So uh, let's do that first. Let's go to stop sharing and see if Zoom is giving me anything I can do to make modifications. Nope, it's just going to keep beeping at us. Well, that's never happened and hopefully it won't happen anymore. I don't, we'll uh, troubleshoot offline with Zoom. Uh, I'm now going to resume sharing. Okay, now uh, at this point, I'm just going to exit the context. Actually, that's probably all we're gonna look at for today. Uh, I do have another data stack that uh, has a bunch of artifacts. We could look at, it and look at restricting the particular range um, where, for example, using the selection box, I also have another, the Raman data that Paul shared. We actually have three signals because it's an RGB image, but it behaves the same way. Instead of you could align on the red and then you could tick the checkbox for green and for blue and apply. Okay, uh, I can leave the, the slice registration either by clicking OK or by clicking the X up here, and that takes me back into the main context. Now, I think that'll probably be enough for today's lesson on slice registration. What I will do at this time. Uh, is the beep from the guy using his phone to call in? No, I don't think that's it. I think the uh, beep is something that Zoom is doing. So um, what I will do now is I will return to the slide deck and uh, really we're done with the discussion. 
And so I'll turn to questions and answers. So we'll take questions and answers today, live as always. And then uh, this webinar will be available online later on YouTube. And then next week, lessons uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 will all be about deep learning. So be sure and tune in onto those. Now, the first question I'm looking at is, uh, do you mention anything about histogram specification? Imposing the histogram of a layer to all layers of a 3D image or impose the histogram of 3D image to another one. So that question, I suppose you're not talking specifically about slice registration, but just trying to normalize the histogram of one slice to all the other slices in the stack or the histogram of one image channel to an entire other 3D image. Both of those are possible in Dragonfly. In the image filtering toolbox, which we examined in lesson 10, sorry, lesson 11, you are able to, there is a filter where you can select one reference image, one that is one reference slice, and then normalize the histogram of all other slices to that reference slice. There is also, as I mentioned in the questions and answers at the top of this discussion, you can right click on an image channel in Dragonfly and choose normalize histogram. Then it will make you choose another image channel, another 3D volume as the target against, it, against which it will form the normalization. Um, next question, audio is an on hold beat, uh, turn off. Well, yeah, the only audio that should be coming through is, uh, oh, let me go to participants one moment, please. Um, well, yeah, I'll try that, see if that makes any difference. Okay. Um, all right now. Uh, so the next question is, can you change the units of the values in the scale bar? We answered that at the top of the hour. Next question is changing unit does not affect the scale bar. Okay. So let me look into that, Sydney. If, if it's not changing the behavior of the scale bar, I'll check with the team. I'm sure I've seen the scale bar be, uh, behave in millimeters and inches and things other than microns. Um, send me an email and we'll make sure that that gets resolved. Uh, next question is, remember, you might need to transfer those values when importing images into Dragonfly from another uh, software. Hmm, okay, Lars, I'm not sure uh, transfer those values. I'm not sure what you're talking about on that question, so I'm gonna move on. Is there a preferred method to correct the shading caused by the edge of the X-ray cone in micro CT? So um, histogram specification or histogram normalization is probably not the best solution to that. Um, if you're talking about the edges at the top and the bottom, so the high cone angle artifact you see in some CT reconstructions, I do not have a good solution off the top of my head for dealing with that. You can deal with it, a lot of the iterative reconstruction methods, um, which maybe you don't have, they may not ship with your vendor's micro CT system, but the iterative reconstruction methods often improve that. And that's all I can think of for right now about how you would deal with uh, that non-uniform shading. Next question is, in older versions of Dragonfly, the basic method of auto alignment always included rotation. With FibSim datasets, this is usually not an issue. Is rotation still part of the basic routine, or do we have to go into advanced to disable rotation? So, um, in this, in versions of Dragonfly, I think since Dragonfly 2.0, uh, if you have Dragonfly Pro, there is a checkbox or a button to go to an advanced tab which for some tools will allow you to enable or disable rotation. But if you don't have Dragonfly Pro, which we're not showing here in this lesson, you don't even have that advanced tab. With most of the methods, rotation is disabled by default. That is because we're expecting most people don't have any rotation introduced in, for example, a FibSim stack, just as you point out. With some of the methods, you can use rotation. So if you're using a sum of square differences or I think a normalized mutual information, then rotation will not be permitted unless you're using Dragonfly Pro and you specifically enable rotation. Um, but the other methods, they do in fact allow ro rotation. The next question is, how do you skew the data set by a certain number of degrees? Uh, that's a good question. We don't actually have the affine transform to apply a data set skew. So if you're working with data that's maybe more than 10 years old and you did not have the tilt correction turned on on your FibSim, and so you have foreshortening, that is the y-axis is, um, is, has the wrong aspect ratio. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I haven't thought about this question in about five years, so I'm not answering it properly. Uh, you're right, if you have that, uh, if you don't have that tilt correction turned on, 
as you do your registration, you're not going to get the banana cucumber effect. You're going to get this other effect where as you scroll through the slices, they're going to, uh, they're going to uh, float up. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that. Maybe we could look at a data set and, and in another lesson and find a, find a good solution and, and describe it. Next question is, can you briefly explain how to sieve subsets of data based on the volume? Um, can you sieve subsets of data based on the volume? Yeah, splitting pores into those above a threshold and those below it. Yes, you can, and that's actually tackled in lesson four, working with multiroids. Once you're in the objects analysis, you can throw away everything that is bigger than 20 microns in cubic volume, or everything whose aspect ratio is not between 0.2 and 0.8. You can set very specific filters, you can see the interactive effect of those, and you can either exclude those data or send those data to another ROI. So that's, a, that's all possible in objects analysis, which is uh, described in lesson four, working with multiroids. Uh, the next question, can you briefly, yeah, I, that's a question I just answered. Um, can you align different image types with different dimensions? Let's say a microscope image to an absorption image. Uh, I think the answer to that question, unfortunately, is no. I believe the current image registration tool, as it is implemented, allows you to compute the registration on a stack and that stack has to have uniform dimensions, so it may be 1,024 by 1,024 by Z slices. And if you have another image channel and you want to copy the transforms that you compute on the first image channel to the second image channel, I think the second image channel would also have to be 1024 by 1024 by Z. So, um, but it's not clear to me any experimental condition where you would have two different detectors with two different pixel sizes, but still have the same displacement. Um, why don't you send me an email offline or, uh, or post something on the forums so we can try and understand that use case better. Next question is, when using the box in stack alignment, is it just using the box for computation, then applying to the entire stack, or is it, in essence, cropping and aligning just the box data? That's a great question. So it is just using the box to compute and evaluate the stack alignment. It still performs the displacement on the entire image. So you're good there. Um, if you wanted to work on just the smaller volume, you could crop it before you pulled it in. Next question is, can you sometimes improve slice registration with additional passes, perhaps after cropping away the ragged edge? Mm, I doubt it. Uh, you could certainly try. After you uh, apply the transform and you're back in the main context, you could crop the image, you'll see the ragged edge that Bill's topic talking about since you have these displacements from slice to slice. So you could crop it and then go back in. I don't expect that you would get an improvement um, after the second pass. Okay, next question. Do you have any suggestions for improving stitching of 3D confocal imaging in the axial direction? Uh, I don't have any suggestions. I never work with confocal data. In fact, I almost never work with light microscope data. So uh, that'd be interesting. I don't even know really how the confocal microscope works. I did not understand that you can do optical sectioning on a shallow depth, get that reconstruction, and then do a reconstruction on a deeper depth. Um, is that what you're doing? And then you, you want to stitch those? I didn't realize the, the optical sectioning uh, had that capability. Um, so I don't know what the challenges are with those data, so I don't have any suggestions. Um, I'm afraid not. Okay, uh, next question. Is elastic alignment possible for compensating for shrinking artifacts? The answer is no. There's no inelastic registration tool currently in Dragonfly. Um, it's a good question, and you're sometimes seeing shrinkage effect due to the resin changing volume over the course of the experiment. So it could be shrinkage. You'll also see, and you see this really badly in some three view data sets, you'll see that the charging is causing an apparent distortion from slice to slice. And so I have some excellent reports from a colleague where when he uses an anti-charging, I think it's a nitrogen gun, maybe it's something else, when he uses an anti-charging solution, he actually, those, those distortions go away. But if, whether it's shrinking or something else, there's currently not an elastic registration tool. It's something we could consider adding in the future um, it's even harder to establish what the ground truth is because I can always morph one data set to look into another to, to match the data set on the following slice, but is the distortion real world? Uh, does it follow the laws of physics or is it just, uh, you know, just, you know, morphing my face onto someone else's face? It's, it's not real, but I could always make a, uh, make a morph. Okay, 
Uh, Marcus asks, can you import your own lookup table? Well, yes, you can. Um, I will post that on the forums and I'll have my colleague Eric answer that on how you would import your own lookup table because it's just a text file. I think it's an XML file. So you could input uh, uh, one, you could input two or more RGBA, I would say RGB triplets or RGBA uh, uh, four tuples that indicate for each um, position or each coordinate in the lookup table. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean here. So if you look at this lookup table, it only has a black, um, let's say key point and a white key point. So this lookup table is defined by two key points. It's the RGB um, and it has to know this is at the zero position and it has zero alpha. And so basically it's the RGB of black plus the alpha and it's at the zero position. This has the RGB of white and it has 100% alpha and it's at the 100% position. But you can have multiple key points in here and they can all have different colors. So you can edit them here and you could save it and then you could look at that XML file and then edit it yourself. But I'll ask my colleague uh, if he has any documentation on how you would uh, write your own lookup table and then import it. Okay, one more question and then we'll be done. Is it possible to apply digital volume correlation to align two volumes that are slightly different? Um, that's a terrific question. Dragonfly does not have a, a DVC tool for digital volume correlation. There is, uh, there are a couple of places we looked at. So um, um, we're, we've talked very briefly with Brian Bay at Oregon State. He's got some really good tools. They're free to use. You could use them yourself if you wanted to outside Dragonfly and then bring them in. Uh, what we'd like to do is connect, reconnect with Brian this, uh, this spring or this summer um, and then take his open source free tools and then integrate them into Dragonfly so that they're free for you to use and you'd be able to use his tools. So it's always great to have uh, uh, really fantastic tools developed by scientific research in the community and then make it easier for you to use those tools in Dragonfly. And of course, make sure those tools are getting more use and more citations. So we're, we're always very happy and excited to do that. Okay, um, and then the last question is Dragonfly registration based on VTK? Uh, it's not, I'm pretty sure the slice registration is not based on VTK. If it were, well, okay, it, not VTK or ITK. I understand your clarifying question. If it were, we would have some elastic registration, which was a question that came up about five minutes ago. So. We have discussed it. Um, we could use the ITK tools for elastic registration. They're probably better suited for a 3D to 3D registration. So it would be more like a digital volume correlation than a slice to slice registration for solving the distortion problems of charging or image compression or shrinkage. Uh, but we haven't dug too deeply into it. So elastic registration, the short answer is it's not in Dragonfly today. But uh, if we were to prioritize it, get it into a future release of Dragonfly. All right, that is all the questions we have for today. So thank you for your attention. Uh, hit the like button if you're watching this on YouTube so we know that you like this content. Put comments in the YouTube. Feel free to tell others about this webinar series. We are starting with lesson 15, diving into deep learning. I think you're gonna really like it. You're gonna see how deep learning works. You're gonna see how you can apply deep learning in Dragonfly for automatic image segmentation, denoising, and more. So thank you everyone. Stay healthy, be good to each other, and we'll see you next week. Take care.